I like to always know who's in the audience, mostly because I say a lot of stuff that gets me in trouble. Um, so by a show of hands, and I'm gonna just randomly pick a couple sectors, if you can tell me who you're representing today, that would be really helpful. So I'll start with the easy one. Who here works for the city of Pittsburgh? Okay, so big chunk of people. Who here works in academia? Big chunk of people. Okay, who here is working for a company that is working on AV technology? Okay, okay. Um, and who here is working for advocacy? All right, all right. And who is somebody from the media here? All right, who did I miss? Okay, I'll call that private sector. <laughs> Great, so that's really helpful. And that's also, I think it's kind of interesting to look at that balance in the room. You know, Chase was talking a lot about community. I think the fact that we have, we don't have people from the broader community per se, but this isn't just a room filled with people, people creating technology. This is a room with some diverse perspectives to talk about where we are, where we were, where we're going. Um, I gave Chase some grief about two pages of talking points because I have an attention problem, but I'm very grateful for them now because I do think it's really important. Um, I've got some history here about the history of driverless cars in the, in the United States. And I have a choice. I can either be kind of sad about this history, or I can be hopeful. Um, sad, because the first driverless car was in 1935, and apparently they were developed because there was a concern about the safety of automobiles and people getting hurt. I'm sad because we are in the same place almost 100 years later. You know, at the Department of Mobility and Infrastructure, our mission is to provide the physical mobility and infrastructure for people to basically live great lives. We want people to be able to get around the city of Pittsburgh without dying or getting seriously killed. The fact that that has to be my goal is sad. If we've had 100 years where we've been working towards changing that reality on the streets in American cities, that's not great. Um, but I'm gonna choose to be hopeful because this is a diverse group of folks talking about these challenges and, and talking about maybe where we go from here. Um, the first driverless, driverless car, like I said, was 1935, and there's a quote here. Regular safety lectures leave a sour taste in everybody's mouth, especially when you start telling another fellow about his shortcomings as a driver. Uh, we'll talk a lot today about autonomous technology and how it should not be centered around passenger cars. Um, but I think there is still a use case there. You know, one of the most compelling things I heard years ago from Fred Dock, who used to be the city of Pasadena, California's director of transportation years ago, was that when you get a critical mass of people that are following the laws on a roadway, in, in, this, in this example, it would be a, a driverless car that has been programmed to do so, then the people on the roadway around those cars will start following laws and will drive more safely. You know, that is still the hope for that particular use case, and I still share that hope. And I also hope that everybody in here will, will drive a little safer when they go home. Um, July 1969, there was an article, thank you, Chase, outlining first system for autonomous vehicle operation called the Electronic Highway, and it talked about an automated vehicle system called for roads to be outfitted with computers. So Chase, I'm glad he gave me talking points on my talking points, that that was the transition in the mindset of the vehicle needing to be the smart infrastructure to the roads and other elements in our environment needing to be the smart infrastructure. And there's space for it all. Pittsburgh is a tech hub. It has been a tech hub before Domi. Maybe there will never be a time after Domi because hopefully we'll be here forever, but far into the future beyond me and beyond most of the people sitting in these chairs, Pittsburgh will remain a tech hub. This is why Pittsburgh has survived. We have half the population that our city once had and we are surviving. And in some places, when you look around beautiful buildings like this, we are thriving. We can't do that without that tech hub vibe and without the investments that are continuing to be brought to this economy through that. Um, but whenever I get a microphone, and whenever I'm asked to talk about AVs, and Aaron over here is tired of hearing me say this, I've got some use cases in mind, and I think people in the city, especially, and people in the advocacy seats would agree. You know, I wanna see an autonomous garbage truck. We can't staff enough people. We are supposed to have three people picking up solid waste, two people that are pulling cans and one person who's driving. We can't find enough people to fill those trucks, so we've got two people in those trucks. That's unsafe. It makes it for not being a great job, and it means that we are not as efficient as we could be, but that's a slow-moving vehicle with a predefined route that I think would, would go okay. Um, I want to see robots in my bike lanes, which we have a proxy to. I saw Armin earlier um, with dash cam for your bike, but when, when I have a robot 
delivering my burrito, can it also be taking down license plate numbers for people who are illegally parked in my protected bike infrastructure? Because as a city, like many cities, it's really hard to staff up for parking enforcement. And in some instances, even in the city of Pittsburgh, our parking enforcement officers are getting assaulted because people don't like to get parking tickets. And that's where we are. So my point is that there are all these use cases that I think could be really economically viable for developers and also really game-changing for, for city life that can make our streets safer and our cities stronger. Um, we wouldn't be here probably talking about this if in 2007 CMU hadn't received a DARPA award that brought in a ton of that money, a ton of that investment, and kicked off the development of a number of companies that have done a lot of great work. Um, but what we've seen in 2022 is that investment has kind of slowed down a little bit. So I'm really looking forward to hearing today about, from the folks in this room, where we think we're going to be tomorrow. You know, you've heard my pitch, which is let's work together to come up with these use cases that will bring in investment, but also solve real world problems that we are facing. And that if we're facing them in Pittsburgh, I like to call Pittsburgh every town America. I worked on both coasts and this is my first time working in between them. And it's every town because we're really relatable in scale, in history, in economy to so many more places in the United States than the San Francisco's, the New York's, the DC's. So if it can work here and it can solve the problems here, I know it can work in so many places. So let's figure it out. Yeah, so as Chase alluded to, our panel's on the winding path of AV technologies in Pittsburgh, so gonna talk a little bit about um, the history, building upon what Kim just talked about, um, but some of the companies operating in Pittsburgh now, some of those use cases beyond just the sort of passenger vehicle robotaxi model. Um, and so going to kick off with introductions. I'm moderating today. I'm Aaron Clark. I'm with a small urban change consultancy firm called CityFi, but I formerly was with uh, the city of Pittsburgh, so got to work with Kim and Angie and still get to work um, with Chase through some funding that the city receives through the Knight Foundation. Um, where Pittsburgh's working collaboratively with San Jose and Miami-Dade County and Detroit um, on some of the issues and opportunities that AVs present to cities. Um, but I will just pass it down the line to let our panelists introduce themselves. Sure, my name is Armin Sami. Uh, I have a small business called Dashcam for Your Bike where we help advocates who bike around cities uh, advocate for safer streets as well as record the ride so if they get hit there's video evidence because it's always hard to win a lawsuit without video evidence. Uh, I was formerly at an AV company here in Pittsburgh um, and so I have experience on more of the advocacy side and more on the AV side. You've got one there. Hi, Stan Caldwell, Executive Director of the Traffic 21 Institute and uh, the Mobility 21 National University Transportation Center at Carnegie Mellon University. Clark Haynes. Uh, I'm the founder of a Pittsburgh-based startup called Velo AI. And uh, similar to Armin, we're really going to figure out ways we can apply innovative technology to build safer streets, particularly for bicyclists, but we're, we're really focused on all forms of mobility. Uh, a little bit about myself. I came out of Carnegie Mellon, uh, did a PhD in robotics uh, starting around 20 years ago, and then spent the last decade uh, working in the autonomous vehicle industry before kind of launching into startup life. Hi, I'm Barry Einzig. Um, I have my own consulting firm, Barry Einzig uh, Advisory Services. Uh, I've been in this industry for close to 30 years. Um, the company I was with at the time actually supplied the sensors that were on the CMU vehicle um, way back when. Um, and uh, I worked in all modes of transportation across the world, uh, but I focused mostly in connected and automated systems. Uh, spent four years with Singapore's CARTS committee, getting them set up for what they wanted to do with connected and automated systems. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Um, so we're going to jump in with just... Uh, 
a little bit of an overview, but hopefully building upon what Kim um, talked about. So we know really especially in the last 12 to 18 months, um, there's been some disruption within the AV space um, and startup space really generally tech space. Um, developers in Pittsburgh but beyond have faced challenges and we've obviously seen some doors closed. Um, but that said, the pursuit to sort of design and demonstrate and deploy self-driving technology for freight, delivery, passenger, transportation hasn't stopped. Um, so I want to start with you, Stan, to sort of build upon what Kim said um, in terms of just that brief history of AVs in Pittsburgh. You've been in the space a long time and sort of where we are now as well. Uh, thanks, Aaron. It's you know, we, we talk about the last 18 months, but this has been really a, a long haul investment. You know, some of the early investments that Pittsburgh made back in the 1980s with the collapse of the, the steel industry, and it was some of these early investments into assets like the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center and the Software Engineering Institute, and then later the, um, in the 1990s, the National Robotics Engineering Center uh, down in Lawrenceville. Um, you know, it was in the 1980s when we started really applying some of the robotics and some of the autonomous vehicle technology. Now, of course, as, as Kim said, a lot of that culminated in 2007, 2007 with the DARPA Urban Grand Challenge that Carnegie Mellon won. That was the third of the three DARPA challenges. And that was a point where um, the D U.S. Department of Defense said, okay, because they had been investing in this technology, you know, so from the 1980s through 2007, you had a lot of Department of Defense funding in this technology, but of course, all of it was very secret, you know, until you had the the grand challenges, which made it more high profile. And then it was actually in, um, then after the 2007 DARPA Urban Grand Challenge, then a lot of those folks went to industry because that's when Department of Defense said, okay, we've advanced this technology enough and now it's time for industry to start taking this over. You know, and that's when folks like Chris Armson went to Google, and, and then there were, you know, GM and Toyota and Ford. Everyone was working on it, but everyone was kind of doing everything in secret. And so I came to CMU in 2010, and that's when I actually knocked on the door of this building very sheepishly because they said, go down there, we've got to get some legislators to do an autonomous vehicle tour. And we got some autonomous vehicles down there. And I came into this building at that far corner over on the right. It was the only the door that would, you know, that I could go to and knocked on it. And, you know, this young grease-covered researcher in jeans and a t-shirt, um, it ended up, you know, being Jared Snyder, who went off to, you know, work with Raj and found Automatica, which is now Motional, which is right down the road, brought, you know, brought me in, and a bunch of the DARPA vehicles were in here. Uh, and, you know, and then including BOSS, which was the autonomous vehicle that uh, won the DARPA Urban Grand Challenge. And the, uh, but then a lot of the Hummers that were here for the earlier challenges. And uh, that's when there was nothing else here. And so, um, but then at that time, it was two years later in 2012 when um, Raj Rajkumar took his autonomous Cadillac that was being worked on right in here and did the 33 mile autonomous vehicle ride from Cranberry Township to the Pittsburgh airport. And then it was, you know, and that's the first time this was kind of brought out into the media since 2007, DARPA Urban Grand Challenge. And then it was a couple weeks after that that, um, that Google, and this is before Waymo, but Google announced that, yeah, we've been operating half million miles in Nevada and California. And then that's when everyone started coming out and saying, yeah, we've been doing this, and we, and so that's when the companies kind of, you know, I say came out of the closet and said, you know, here's what we're doing with automated vehicles. And that's what began this hype cycle in this race. And then that's where we kind of got into this whole, you know, into the hype cycle of it. And, and I see in, then again, so this is around 2014 when that, um, I'm sorry, 2013 when that, when that, um, um, a demonstration was done. But then it was 2015, that's when Uber came to town, and then that's when um, also the ITS America, Intelligent Transportation Society of America annual meeting was hosted here in Pittsburgh, and that's when 
we really started increasing a lot of the you know, activity locally here, and then we started seeing a lot of the more jobs open up and, and the hype cycle begin. So I think that was, and then of course it was after, you know, and then from 2015 when we were kind of getting into that hype cycle was 2018 when we had the uh, fatality of the pedestrian in Arizona that really kind of started putting everything into the, uh, you know, ending the hype cycle and putting into the, into the trough of disillusionment. And we're still kind of working our way out of that now into what is, what is reality. We saw the hype and we saw the crash and what is now the reality. So that's where I kind of see us in Pittsburgh where, you know, we were in the middle of that here. Yeah. Thanks. Really helpful kind of context setting, setting and maybe memory refreshing for uh, some of us that it's, uh, it's been, yeah, a long time and a good reminder that you know, a lot of this tech development's been happening for decades before it was a little bit more publicly discussed as well. Um, I think we heard from Kim during her opening that Pittsburgh, but I also hear this from a lot of other cities um, that we work with, that they wish they'd see AV tech used uh, a little bit more to improve cities and to solve real community problems that isn't always that robo-taxi model. Um, and so I'm curious to hear a little bit from Clark and Armin. First, kind of what um, made you leave or sparked an interest in um, leaving robo-taxi companies that you were formerly with and focusing more on, you're both more in bike kind of safety spaces. Um, but so a little bit of that and then just kind of um, what's worked well in kind of working with the cities or how can cities do a better job of supporting or collaborating with companies that are aligned in some of those like goals and outcomes that, that Kim discussed. Okay, I'll, I'll jump into the first half and maybe we should each do that and then do the second half sure. later. Um, so I guess a little bit more on my background. I spent the first half of my career working on like robots with legs and arms and humanoids and lots of cool stuff. After the DARPA Grand Challenges and Urban Challenge, there was actually one uh, called the DARPA Robotics Challenge, which was inspired by Fukushima of can we make disaster response robots. And so I actually read, led the, the team that went and competed in that, and CMU was one of the winners of that, that competition. That was in uh, 2012 to 2015. Uh, 2015, coincidentally, was the year that Uber showed up in town and hired uh, you know, a, a large fraction of the researchers at the National Robotics Engineering Center. Uh, and I was one of those, and I kind of put a pause on working on pure robots out of an excitement of what we could do for our cities by bringing autonomous vehicles. Uh, I was at CMU in the 2000s, so all of my friends had done the Grand Challenges and Urban Challenge. And I was always, no, I want to work on these legged things. Those are so fun, running robots and stuff. Um, but as a lifelong bike commuter, I really wanted to see this happen. I was really excited to, you know, hey, I'm going to convert my garage into an apartment because by 2020, we'll have so many cars on our, like autonomous vehicles on our streets, I won't need to own a car anymore. Uh, you know, 2020 came and went, and 2020 was the year that it was. Um, but really, a lot of it was an, an excitement of, hey, this is an answer to hit Vision Zero. This is an answer to make our cities uh, more walkable, more bikeable. And as a lifelong bike commuter, that meant a lot to me. Uh, the trough of disillusionment is very real. Uh, Stan brought up the 2018 uh, Tempe incident uh, where an Uber autonomous vehicle collided with a pedestrian. Uh, I was actually one of the only autonomy engineers that was on Uber's internal safety review group that went through everything top to bottom, and made recommendations, not about that specific incident, but about you know, how, do you, how do you change the culture of an organization? How do you set best practices? Uh, and that was you know, really career changing for me to go through the experience of like, well, what are we building? Are, are we building technology for technology's sake? Um, are we building things that actually make people's lives better? Or are we going the wrong direction? And I think that set off a lot of doubt in my mind of, 
what are we building? What should we be building? Um, it was about a year later, uh, you know, tech companies, we get, get great parental leave policies. I was off on parental leave with the, the birth of my second kid. And I wasn't just commuting to and from work. I was driving my first kid to swim lessons and music class. And every day I would go out. Like, I'm used to biking on the streets and having my, like, super secret back alley route to get safely to the office and back. That's just what my life was. And then to switch to driving around town every day, driving a little kid and seeing so much craziness every time you go out of like someone doing something crazy that I just like autonomous vehicles are not going to get here soon enough to fix all those problems. And so that really launched the ideas of like, well, we need more feedback loops for drivers. What can we do to improve the driving experience for everyone so that it's super safe? And you know, I wound my way eventually started a startup a couple of years ago. And our, our goal is to basically take autonomous vehicle tech, so this is kind of one of our prototypes. Uh, it's a smart sensor. It has all the algorithms and AI and ML systems that kind of get loaded into an autonomous vehicle. And this one is made for mounting on a bike. And it can basically tell you what's going on. It can give feedback to the driver when they're putting the bicyclists in a dangerous situation. And that's what we're really trying to do, to build those feedback loops to kind of make things safer for everyone on the streets. And you know, as a small startup, we're, we're focusing super tightly on bikes right now, but we of course want to see ways to bring this tech to kind of all forms of giving more feedback to drivers, to pedestrians, to bicyclists, and kind of improve safety for everyone. So. So I, 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 I'm very honored that Chase invited me to this panel because I think I am deeper in the trough of disillusionment than anyone else here. Uh, I, I did not, I never did robotics. I joined a self-driving car company because I cared about bike safety and I saw that as a solution uh, and became very disillusioned while there. Um, and there's a few quotes that stand out. Um, one is I was trying to convince leadership to uh, not to expect bicyclists to yield at stop signs, which they call running stop signs. Uh, and the response I got was, if a bicyclist runs a stop sign and gets hit by a car, that's their fault. And that mindset, like, it, it's just the wrong way to go about it, right? Like, yes, there's the liability, right? And the bicyclist perhaps is liable. Um, but, but that mindset is not safety focused, right? That mindset is how do we build a cool robot car? Uh, and, and this happened in a few other instances, right? Like, for example, if you're a passenger in a robo-taxi, you cannot see the rear view mirrors, the, the rear facing mirrors. How do you know if you're gonna open a door into a bike lane and door a bicyclist? Uh, this is very easy to solve. The self-driving car knows that there's a bicyclist coming. Should it lock the door? Should it put an internal warning? Uh, or should you say, well, that's a passenger's fault, they should have looked behind them. Uh, and again, it's, it's like, are you building something to keep people safe, or are you just trying to deploy technology and avoid liability for killing somebody? And as long as you can throw your hands up and say, well, we weren't technically at fault, like, are you still responsible? So I'm not saying everybody's mindset is like this. I just became disillusioned with uh, the motivation and the money in the industry, right? The goal was to deploy as fast as possible, and anything that wasn't on that track uh, doesn't get the money. Um, so I, I, I left because I just didn't feel like robo-taxis were the solution to keeping bicycling safe. Uh, I think if you take a list of the things that robo-taxis solve, and you say like, okay, it you know, reduces parking needs downtown and increases safety, uh, whatever that list is, take that list and now ask the reverse, which is if we wanna make roads safer, what do we do? The robo-taxi answer will be pretty far down the list, right? If you don't want bicyclists hit, number one is build better biking for, uh, bicycling infrastructure. Number seven or eight might be the robots filled with robo-taxis. Um, and so that was my path to exiting the, the self-driving industry and focusing specifically on, on bike safety because that, that's, where, um, that's why I joined and why I left. Okay. Yeah, I think we can jump into maybe part two, but maybe to add um, a little bit of context. So just a reminder for panelists and audiences, <clears throat> wanted to hear a little bit about how um, 
with use cases like, like the ones you guys are describing and working on, um, cities and even states, government in general, can work better to support those companies that really are aligning with the goals and outcomes and sort of community needs. And I think just uh, Clark listening to you, well actually listening to you both talk, um, I think a lot of cities feel like they had to be very reactive to the robo taxi models coming into cities um, because they weren't necessarily like, you know, a lot of this development was kind of behind closed doors early in early stages. And um, even some of these like safety elements, had there been closer collaboration and alignment, I think early on, some of these obstacles or like areas of conflict could have potentially been avoided. Um, and so curious kind of with like that in mind specifically, um, whether it's your personal experiences or just like looking back, how could government and these companies have worked in parallel a little bit better knowing that Often there's a hesitation, obviously, from the industry that if you involve government too early, that can really stifle and like slow things down a bit. But it does seem like um, better alignment early on could have put us in a better place now with sort of like the development and, um, and, and use cases around some AV tech. So I would love to hear from both of you, but from all, all the panelists on that as well. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's a really hard question of like, when does regulation need to come in when it's a super, you know, early stage innovative product, when there's a competitive landscape, when there's, you know, millions and billions of dollars going into it. So it, I think it's easy in retros retrospect to say that like, oh, we should have had a driving test that every single car company needed to do before they could be allowed on the streets. Um, that's also super hard because then, you know, okay, who makes the driving test? How do you make certain it's not being gamed? Um, things like that. Uh, but I, I, I think the most important thing that we could have probably done a little bit better is really, really involve the community in what are everyone's needs. Uh, in, in startup world, you like to talk about uh, vitamins and painkillers. And vitamins are the thing that you take to make you sh yourself feel better. That like, oh, this is good for me, I should take this. But then you forget to take a, a week and nothing happens and you don't have you know, that feedback of like, oh, it actually got better. Uh, if you're actually bringing a painkiller, you're dealing with a pain that someone is feeling every single day. And maybe going back to the autonomous vehicles uh, of what the technologies were developing, were we really developing a painkiller? Is it, is it a painkiller that, you know, it's too annoying for me to sit in a rideshare vehicle with a driver and I really need a driverless one? You know, if I just want to get to the office really, really fast, I can hop in a rideshare vehicle and that takes away some painkiller elements of like needing to find parking and things like that. Um, so I, yeah, I think coming back to the technology for technology's sake argument of, you know, really evaluating what we're doing and whether it is, you know, really good for the community and has the community been involved. Um, and that's a huge motivation for what we're doing personally as far as making safety devices for bicyclists. It's pretty obvious that if bicyclists are getting killed on the road every single day, it's a good painkiller if we can help prevent that. So, yeah. So um, I'm Barry and I'm actually on the technical committee for Domi to build out the infrastructure for smart spines. Because I'm a technologist, I have a, an opinion that's broader than this, so I'm going to make the disclaimer that although I'm helping to support that, these comments are my own. Um, 2012, 13, uh, we were on the precipice of requiring every car to talk to every car. The federal government was this close. All of the tech firms came out, and some of the major universities came out and said, we don't need infrastructure. We just need hundreds of billions of dollars, and we can make this work in 2020. They burned the hundreds of billions of dollars, and they didn't get there. Now we're back to where we were then, which is to build out the infrastructure necessary for vehicles to be able to talk to vehicles. Whether they're automated or not, who cares? If we're really trying to solve for safety, let's focus on connected vehicles first. Because everybody likes to call them smartphones. 
How many of your smartphones are truly smart when you put them into airplane mode? That's what we're doing with AVs now. We're burning cash in AVs instead of putting money into the infrastructure so that these vehicles of all types can be contextualized for safety. Yeah, that's a, a good point, Barry. And I think the another point that we're missing is you know, there, there are two parallel paths for automated vehicles, and I've been, you know, trying to say automated for the last decade rather than autonomous for this reason, is that, you know, research that we've done at Carnegie Mellon showed that, you know, there's these six levels of automation, zero to five, and currently we have level two automation out there in vehicles we're buying today, and level three is already on the ground in Europe and allowed in Nevada, so level three is coming too. So we're kind of halfway there on this path of automation, and a lot of you are seeing it in applications that are in your cars now, like adaptive cruise control and automatic emergency braking. But you know, we at CMU, we did early research on just level one automation, which was that first level, and that proved that research proved that it was actually saving lives and saving money with these first levels. So, there, so to address this issue that we've all been talking about is how do we improve safety out there with automation? We're already, well, not we, companies, automotive companies are already on that path of doing that without having fully driverless cars putting higher levels of automation into the cars with safety features. And so I think that's important to, to understand that the work that was being done in here with the GM labs back in the, you know, in the, in the early 2000s, that was feeding the fully driverless car activity, but it was also feeding things like the GM Super Cruise and other applications that are out in the cars that, that we're buying today. So I think it's important to, uh, to recognize that, and that's safety, that's safety applications that, we, that are there now. Yeah, I, just going on that a little, the, uh, the only vehicles that are limited uh, on our streets today are spin scooters, right? You're capped at 15 miles per hour. Uh, it's possible to do this more broadly, right? It's possible to have so much more um, and we just, we don't apply these regulations to drivers, right? If you're driving a personal car, you can do whatever you want. Uh, and I, I think, you know, I, I rented a Tesla for a 12 hour road trip a few months ago, uh, and it had whatever they're calling it, not the full self-driving, but you know, adaptive cruise control or self autopilot. Um, and it was amazing. I, I drove 12 hours and I got to my destination and I wasn't tired because I wasn't making all of these little micro adjustments. It was doing that for me and I could focus on the big picture of driving and I had to pay attention the whole time. It would uh, get upset if I didn't have my hand on the steering wheel. I had to like constantly tug at it. Um, but it was a much better driving experience both because it would automatically brake for me, adaptively cruise control so I had the right distance to the car in front of me, but also because I was less tired, right? There's less fatigue when driving. Uh, and I just think those, uh, you know, ADAS systems or level two or whatever you want to call them, uh, th they're incredible, but they don't attract billions of dollars like the, the fully autonomous robotaxi. So what could we have done before? I don't know. You would have never gotten the billions of dollars the self-driving or uh, automated car industry did um, without selling the vision of robotaxi, right? Imagine every Uber on the road was automated. Imagine how much money you could make. Yeah, that's a vision that attracts a ton of investment saying, hey, I'm less tired on a 12 hour road trip. You're just, you're not gonna get there. So I don't know what we could have done differently. The history of MEMS Excellent. is that uh, it started off, actually, it was invented by a Pittsburgher um, in 1969 at Westinghouse, and it was first used for military operations for um, satellite. And then it was used for airbag accelerometer um, to deploy, it was an actuator and a sensor to uh, deploy uh, an air, it was accelerometer rather, it, uh, to deploy the airbag sensor. And the, the thing about the airbag sensor is that they showed, they did a demonstration and they showed that it was saving 
you know, thousands and thousands of lives. So it became mandated. And that's how it happened. So I think you know, like that's a uh, rollover, like again, gyroscopes, accelerometers, sensors, you know, all of that. It was, it saved lives. Um, so it's that connection with NHTSA and showing, and then California oftentimes leading the way in safety, and that helped um, create an industry. And then eventually that little accelerometer in the, the airbag was what was put into a uh, Motorola flip phone, the Razor, and then eventually the iPhone, creating a whole new industry, billion, billion dollar industry. So that's kind of how it happens, and it's happened in the past. Um, but it's my sense that safety is not sexy. Like, that's the problem, is uh, it wasn't seen as sexy, so Tesla and their cool vehicles are sexy, and, uh, and, and so that's been the, the path. Um, I raised the issue of safety can be sexy, because you get to keep people in your life, um, and I don't know. I mean, that's something like Safety 21, the, the new t UTC that you're, you're, is coming to Carnegie Mellon. Hopefully, they can bring that back. You're welcome to take that slogan, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I think I'll, I'll just mention to, to Barry's comment back you know, earlier on the connected vehicle technology. That's exactly what happened. You know, Ann Arbor did the safety pilot, and I was tracking that because we actually applied for the safety pilot in Pittsburgh, and they beat us on it. So on, it could have happened here. But the safety pilot was 1,500 vehicles that were equipped with this connected vehicle technology, tracked it, had the data, and showed that, oh, if, here's how many lives could have been saved if all the vehicles were equipped. The whole idea was to have that data to prove back in 2013 that that this was possible and give that to NHTSA. And again, they were that close, but, but, uh, but didn't happen. Go ahead, Clark. I want to jump in with just a, a little comment on safety statistics and maybe how we have to be careful to make certain they're not being gamed, of course. Um, one of my big worries, whether it's L2 or L4 autonomy, is that we can get something that in the grand scheme is safer. So automatic emergency braking and other driver assistance features, these are showing 30 to 60% reductions in incidents, accidents, injuries, and so forth. That's great. I think we should seriously look into getting them mandated by the federal government. That will do a lot. The thing where this gets dangerous is, imagine we come out with an autonomous vehicle tomorrow that is twice as safe. If everyone had it, there would be half as many deaths as there are today. That would be a net improvement for society. But the one thing that we have to be worried about if, is if there's a distribution shift of those deaths. Did we somehow displace uh, internal occupant deaths or you know, drunk driving or anything? And all of a sudden, for instance, more pedestrians and more cyclists are being killed. I think this is a thing that we have to be very, very careful about, especially when we talk about these broad statistics of how do we really needle into them and get at the exacts of what is changing in each scenario and, and also require our companies to do this. Um, you know, maybe we're gonna go into this a little bit, but there is a shift from pure focus on L4, L5 autonomous driving back down to L2. You see this with kind of what has happened with you know, one of the former companies here in town, Argo. A lot of those engineers are now at a company called Latitude that is developing L2 solutions for Ford. Um, and I think we, ha we just have to take these lessons in that L2, by definition, um, is not a complete solution. And we need to make certain we understand what are the areas where the system doesn't know what it should be doing and if it's going to be doing it correctly. And keep that in mind as we deploy them further. Yeah. Um. I want to talk a little bit, and I feel like we've already started to touch on this, but Stan, some of the points you were making, I feel like, um, you know, and there were reasons for this because they needed to generate investment and um, excitement, but I think a lot of cities and maybe even like members of the public kind of feel like a lot of the AV, like robo taxi companies kind of over promised and are now under delivering over time. Um, and so, curious, but I guess to your point, you know, 
there has been a lot of advancements in even the cars that we drive today, and it's more subtle. It's almost happening subtly enough that we don't even notice or appreciate the like safety features um, that this technology has allowed in vehicles that we drive today. But I'm curious kind of, um, particularly for you and Barry, but I think it's we can all just open up the full panel, um, what the sort of path forward for, for AV tech, like specifically in Pittsburgh, but maybe more generally than that is, like where, do, where are we gonna see more investment? Where do we see those closer term applications? I know we've hit on a couple, um, and maybe Barry, if you wanna start with some of the connectivity building upon what you've already talked about, but just curious if there's kind of more there where you know we're not just as disillusioned of like the L4, L5 conversation only and like what's more realistic moving forward because I think at least from a public and, and government perspective all of the attention and focus has been on L4, L5 like self-driving and how do we prepare and how do we react to this and like what's maybe more realistic moving forward where is where should um you know, cities be putting their focus around this technology. So when you mentioned, Stan, the uh, ITS World Congress here in Pittsburgh, there was another event that happened during that event, which was the beginning of the CAT Coalition. Um, for those of you that are not familiar, there is an organization called the CAT Coalition that has evolved from AASHTO, and then it went to ITE, and it's now actually part of SAE. And everybody thinks of SAE as automotive standards, but to your point earlier, SAE is also automotive, aviation, so what, we're, what we now have is an organization that is sharing between infrastructure owner operators, cities, states, and national governments, and private companies, whether they be tech companies, whether they be the OEMs themselves, or they be tier ones. And so you have cities, states, national governments that are actually implementing infrastructure. Because there's a big debate about the sky is falling over a radio. Well, big deal. We change out Wi-Fi radios every handful of years anyway. The rest of that infrastructure all has to be built. And a prime example, uh, before I get to the Domi piece, I'll, I'll talk about some other areas. Florida's just doing it statewide. Florida has decided that every district, in, every DOT district in, in Florida will have at least one connected and automated vehicle program actively running in operations. Not a pilot, not a test, operational. The state, in the, uh, the state of Utah, every traffic light in the state of Utah is connected and they're building out the connected vehicle infrastructure in every traffic light in the entire state. Georgia DOT, uh, around Atlanta, the same issue is going on. Um, I used to work for Cisco, and people would ask me, what's it going to take to transform? The reality is the first city that has the horsepower, political horsepower, and the will, and the understanding of why it's important to light up the entire city for connected and automated vehicle systems will become the next Silicon Valley. No one owns that right now. And it may not even be an American city if we don't, if we don't hurry up. Anything to add? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's a hard act to follow. But I think that um, we, if we look at the um, autonomy report that was put out by the uh, RIDC here in the, in the Chamber of Commerce, you know, they're looking at autonomy, broad applications. So not even just on the vehicle side, but on the warehousing side and on the aviation side with drones and you know, advanced air mobility, all these different activities out there. And so we've even seen this nationally. I've been you know, kind of tracking different trends in these emerging technologies, and it will move from electric vehicles to drones to, you know, um, you know, autonomous vehicles. Of course, we're seeing, um, you know, in the automated vehicle industry, Aurora just, you know, is you know moving to more of the trucking applications, and just announced a big, exciting, you know, trucking um, application in in Texas that's that's going into deployment, commercial deployment. You know, so so. The industry is still in such flux, you know, let the industry kind of go through those exploration of business models, and that's fine, and governments aren't gonna be able to control that. Um, but the underlying technologies that are fueling these 
can still be supported with the research that's happening here and the jobs that are happening here. But you know, that's one exciting thing, and we're not used to it in Pittsburgh. You know, when, when, when Argo shut down, there was a lot of doom and gloom, and my reaction to the media and others at that time was, look, we wanted to be more like the Silicon Valley. We wanted to have all this kind of outside venture money coming in instead of all the, you know, our companies moving to the coast. We wanted to have that here. So we have to be ready that when that money kind of comes and goes and it's a much different culture, that we need to accept that, okay, it doesn't mean that it's like, you know, U.S. Steel shutting down. It's not the 1980s again. This is the new industry. And so we have to accept that and be able to have the job shift and move from industry to industry. And uh, so, I, so I think it's just us being more sensitive to, you know, to those industry trends. And this is just a, you know, still a very blossoming industry and we need to be ready for those changes. Thanks. Clark, I feel like in our sort of prep materials, you had an interesting example of another technology that followed sort of a similar trajectory that we're seeing AVs fall at least right now, and so I would love to hear you talk about that and kind of draw that parallel. Yeah, I was, I was thinking this a bunch before. I think there are actually two different scenarios to talk through. Like, obviously, we've gone through the whole promise of L4, L5. We're just going to have autonomous vehicles whizzing about uh, out in front of our houses and our businesses all day long, and that hasn't happened. Um, I think one aspect that you see is... You know, of course, the move uh, very pragmatically that companies are making to long haul truck trucking, you know, moving boxes, uh, whether it's on the roads or in uh, distribution centers, that is an industrial need that can help these companies make money and survive return on investment and all of those things that you need to do as a company in order to survive. Um, and so I think that in particular follows the trends of just warehouse and um, factory automation, where rather than these you know, general purpose humanoid robots that can do everything that a human can, uh, I know this, I've worked on general purpose humanoid robots that can't do uh, everything that a human can, um, the applications that you end up with are very special purpose in factories. And so I think we see part of the industry going that direction of very special purpose autonomous vehicles, whether it's trucking, logistics yards, or even back into the factories, uh, forklifts, automated forklifts. This is still a very big deal, and there are new companies being founded just in recent years that are, that are going after this, even while there are established players that were you know, founded almost 30 years ago doing this. Um, that's one aspect, but I think there's an even more exciting one uh, that we can draw a parallel to, which is kind of back to connected mobility, which Barry has been talking a bit. Um, if you go back 30, 40 years, uh, there was you know, maybe a similar industry, the promise of the smart home. And I know when I was a teenager, I thought I was going to work on smart homes. I was so excited. You know, this master commander control panel in my living room that controlled everything in my house. And there were companies that were doing this in the 1980s and 1990s. And they built these systems that were you know, just perfect for those Silicon Valley millionaires who could afford it. And they deployed them, and I, I, have, I don't have a scientific study on this, but I'm going to guess that all of those are completely useless today and not actually adding value to their homes. It probably like reduced the sale price of their Silicon Valley mansion by 100000 rather than you know, being the promise of what it was. And I think there's an interesting example to look at how did smart home technology go in the decades since then? And you can probably point at, you know, in particular one company, uh, what is now Google Nest, bringing about a very pragmatic device. You know, they were just replacing a $30 Honeywell thermostat. You know, how much simpler a robot can you get? It checks, is the temperature too high or too low? And it flips a bit and says, okay, turn on the heat. It's, it's too low. They replaced this with technology that did the exact same thing. It flipped a bit if it needed to turn the furnace on or turn the air conditioning on. But the thing that it did was it connected it to a greater ecosystem. It connected it to the internet. It enabled all of these things that you couldn't do before with your thermostat. And I'd argue that the, the smart homes that we have today are way more powerful than these $100,000 systems that were deployed 30, 40 years ago. And so that's where, you know, personally, I'm super excited 
for new applications we haven't even thought of in terms of connected mobility and how we can get more connected vehicles. They don't need to be autonomous. They just need to have some uh, additive value. Um, and you know, we should debate about what, what do they do in connected mode? What do they do in solo mode? Still have a driver's test to make certain you don't run into buses that are right in front of you. Uh, things like that for our, our smart uh, vehicles. But I think there's a lot that we can kind of learn about how that deployed with lots of smaller, cheaper devices rather than these all-in-one $100,000 systems. So. Thanks. Anyone else yeah. that? Um, well, I do want to save, I think we were ahead of schedule when we started, but want to save a little bit of time for um, some Q&A since we'll have the time. But I do want to um, maybe push the panelists to think um, maybe like optimistically, but a lot of the work that CityFi does is between the public and private sectors and finding that sort of sweet spot of collaboration that's really hard to find a lot of times. Um, and so I'm curious, just thinking back even five years ago, maybe it's like 10 years ago at this point, but what were like some assumptions made maybe on both sides that uh, we can learn from with like the next emerging technology and what should be done differently? And I know we've heard like some realities that it's, um, you know, difficult, especially in early stage, um, early stages of developing a new technology to sort of bring government in or to make it, you know, you have to overpromise to some degree because you really need investment, for instance. But is there that sweet spot of collaboration that could have been hit several years ago that would have put us in a better position maybe than we're in today or would have accelerated some of the, the development or applications of the technology? anyone has any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I can, I can jump in with a few different kind of lessons learned. I think the main thing is uh, bringing all stakeholders together and setting milestones and doing that between the public and the private. Um, I, have, I have a funny, you know, this isn't a public-private pairing one, but I have a funny analogy from uh, early days at the autonomous vehicle company that I was at. Uh, in 2015, we needed to figure out uh, what we were going to build out as far as a data center. Autonomous vehicles, you know, we were famously saying at the time that, oh, you know, in, in one hour, an autonomous vehicle produced more data than the entirety of Twitter produces in a year. You know, that's not fair. You're comparing 140 character messages to giant video streams. Um, but we were making decisions on how we were gonna roll out the data center that we needed to store what we had coming off of our autonomous vehicles. And this was, you know, Amazon Web Services existed. It was earlier than it is today, but it existed, and it was a very reasonable choice for most businesses. Uh, at the time, we were building against the, hey, 2020, we're gonna have tens of thousands of autonomous vehicles everywhere. We won't be able to afford AWS service fees in 2020. So we're going to make our own data center right now. We put it in an underground lake mine north of town called Iron City, where you can actually use the aquifer to cool down your supercomputers. Uh, it's a cool facility. Uh, but, you know, I don't know how much money we spent, but I'm sure it was tens of millions of dollars. And it was exactly the wrong call because we didn't have these milestones set up to say, are we unlocking the next stage? Is it the right time to make that call? So I bring that back to the kind of the public-private pairing of, you know, especially as we discuss collaborations, let's sell the vision, absolutely. We, we should be selling a vision. That's how you bring in investment dollars and everything. Uh, but let's also be pragmatic about what milestones do we need to, need to hit to kind of continue going down the path that we're going toward that vision. I've got two, thanks for doing that so I had time to think about it. The first would be yes and, um, which is just a wonderful phrase. Um, in 2012 and 13, when all the Silicon Valley giants said we can do this, we don't need the federal government anymore, it should have been yes and, and the federal government said yes, thank you very much for building all these automated systems and these remarkable pieces, and we're going to bet out the infrastructure to support it. Had we done that, we would be 
I don't know, seven years into that process by now, almost 10 years into that process by now, and we'd have a lot more infrastructure in place in order to enable all vehicles. The second part of it is our industry has to learn how to share. Uh, we're not good at that, um, and we like to keep everything to ourselves. And a prime example of that is when we lost our spectrum. Uh, a long, long time ago, um, we all wanted more Wi-Fi, so we decided to open up the 5.8 gigahertz spectrum for Wi-Fi. When we did that, um, anybody that was in the RF business could easily go 5.8, 5.9, kind of side by side. One's going to have a lot of market penetration and a lot of broadcast. One's going to have a little bit of market penetration and a little bit of broadcast. Um, at the time, we had built a proposal to share that spectrum between the two so that the automotive industry and the ITS industry could have used all of the 5.8 band and all of the 5.9 band that it had licensed. And said they played the game of mine and they lost. And so now we have half as much, well, not even half as much spectrum. And so I think part of it is um, learning how to work with other industries and negotiate things that make sense. To your point about smart homes, right? Uh, a lot of that was highly proprietary, nobody wanted to share. And so it got destroyed because you, that nothing was interoperable. I noticed uh, in the first round of the SMART grants that came out, this is U.S. Department of Transportation, kind of new innovative technology um, grants that came out for the request for proposals mentioned that, you know, if you're going to do um, applications such as automated vehicles, they should be with kind of city-owned fleet vehicles. You know, and, and so I think that was really insightful and kind of a, a shift to saying that I think early on that, you know, rather than cities trying to, um, trying to work with the companies and trying to figure out, because, you know, as was mentioned earlier, you know, you had this big split of the company saying, well, we don't need the government, you know, we don't want to rely on government to put in the infrastructure, we want to do our own. Um, but back to, you know, Kim's example is really good of something of something like the garbage truck where we can show, hey, here's an automated feature that's solving a very specific problem of the municipality. We're going to put funding into this and we're going to put research into this to address a problem that we're having and to be able to show here's, uh, here's the, the, the tangible results and here's how we invested into the digital and physical infrastructure to make that happen. Um, so I think that if, you know, and, and even considering that moving forward, if cities and states, and to, you know, Barry's point earlier too, of what, you know, Florida and Georgia and others are now doing, you know, they're investing into their assets, you know, the, the traffic signals or the street lights or other types of assets or their, their fleet vehicles in order to show applications. I think um, that would have been more helpful in the beginning rather than just kind of each, you know, each of the uh, partners kind of, um, you know, being in the awkward uh, high school dance scenario where, you know, each is just waiting for the other to make the first move. Yeah, I, I, I don't have more to add on what they could have done to help, and so I'll come from a different perspective, which is what more regulation might have helped the public trust these companies more. And something that I've heard, and I don't know every autonomous company, but my understanding is that every single one had basically no privacy protections. So what this means is if I'm looking to stock my, I don't know, ex-partner, I could put a geofence around their house and watch every time somebody, a self-driving car company goes past that house and see if there's a car parked in the driveway. Uh, and I, I know that large companies do this, I know that startups do this, and that there's no audit logs often, there's no regulation from governments that I shouldn't be able to do this. This is something that Facebook ran into where people could stalk their ex-partners and just log into their profiles and see all of, like I don't think they could see the messages, but they could see you know, what people are saying on private profiles. Uh, and there was just no, no protection here, right? And obviously, in the industry, you need access to this data, right? Like I needed to be able to say, at this intersection, what's going wrong? Give me 100 logs of data. That was useful to me. Um, but I think from Pittsburgh, city of Pittsburgh's perspective, like, should that have been logged in some way? Should some external person been able to 
make sure that that's not being abused by employees. Uh, and that's the type of thing you hear on the street, right? Outside of this room, when people don't trust self-driving car companies or, or automated car companies, it's very often this privacy factor, right? Like, what are they recording of me? How is it being used? That's something I hear a lot in the bicycling community. Uh, and, and I think an early partnership could have mitigated a lot of that hesitation because I, I don't think it was abused, but I don't think a lot of the public trusts that it wasn't abused. Thanks. Um, well, let me just do a time check. We have a few minutes. Are there any questions? Chris? You want a mic? Hi, Ron Chris Saving, Mobilify, Southwestern Pennsylvania. I want to come back to something that Armin said a few questions back uh, and uh, Clark also hit on, um, and that is what's happening outside of the vehicle. So, um, so safety within the vehicle is probably greater than it's ever been, autonomy or not, right? 2020, lowest VMT uh, in a very long time in this country, highest pedestrian fatalities ever recorded, not per VMT in total. 2021, worse. 2022 is looking to be even worse than that. And so we also have situations where cars are now being put out there that you almost have to rely on the tech in order to make sure that you don't hit something um, with enormous blind spots in SUVs. Um, and in some cases, people whose career it is to test drive cars, giving the cars back to the companies because they're like, I don't want to touch this thing because I'm terrified of hitting a kid or something. So we've spent a long time starting with the, the, and I also remember this also being a discussion about the three-point harness in the back seat in the 80s. Um, and 2020, which was a TV show for folks, was very good at making this look sexy by dummies falling out of the back of the vehicles and crash tests um, and scaring parents. We need to, how do we move this focus on a policy perspective, on an engineering perspective, to not what's happening inside the vehicle, but what the vehicle is doing on the outside? Because I also remember when this person in Phoenix was hit, almost immediately the blame was being put on the person for how dare they cross the street. And that I don't think is acceptable. Well, I, it should not be acceptable by anybody for that to be the place where we start with this discussion. Um, so this getting outside of the cabin and into the street, how do we change that discussion? How do we start getting to a place where, um, uh, whether it's through safety rigs or otherwise, the feds are starting to regulate this a little bit more stringently as they did in the 80s and 90s with some of these technologies. Also crash zones on minivans because they didn't have those back then. Um, this is a lot of caffeine fueled ramble, but um, you know, we got to get past what's happening inside the cabin to what's happening outside the cabin and how do we change that mindset and what responsibility do each of you in front of the room and those of us in this room also have to do that yeah i mean i'll i, I won't give specifics i'll just point out that your numbers are uniquely american right this problem doesn't happen in other modernized countries right so uh, the, the look at the graphs of pedestrian deaths in 2020 in America versus uh, Japan versus UK. Like we are skyrocketing off the charts. Um, so what are we doing differently? Uh, I, I think there are many answers, but it has to start with the, you know, we, we don't need to reinvent the wheel, right? We can look at what other people are doing, right? What, what is different about our safety rating? A five-star safety rating has nothing to do with people outside the vehicles, should it? Uh, should there be any crash tests for different size vehicles? Because right now, uh, to, when you do a crash test, you do it with a similar vehicle, which means that you're now in a disadvantage in a sedan, which means you're certainly at a disadvantage on a scooter or a bicycle or as a pedestrian or a wheelchair. So uh, I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel. I think we need the political will to make the changes that other countries have already made. Um, I was just going to say, I, I think it's no accident that, you know, out of a panel of four, there are two of us that have startups building bike experience stuff. Uh, and this is to that point of getting outside of the cab and 
getting some data, getting some experiences, and being able to share with more people of what the experience is like being a bicyclist when you're in front of a, a lifted pickup truck that weighs, you know, I, I can't even do the math in my head, but 100 times more than you. Um, and I, I think that's kind of one of the things of just raising awareness as a community of what the experiences of pedestrians are like, what the experiences of bicyclists are like, and how decades of kind of singular focus on car culture, uh, what that's done to our streets and our cities. Um, I think that's super useful. You know, there's also other low hanging fruit that maybe there's some promise in of, you know, I think it was just last month, uh, you know, fixing the light truck loophole as far as our, our emission standards go, that if we can disincentivize the car companies to just making more SUVs uh, and actually force people to make more efficient vehicles across the spectrum, I think that'll do a lot and reduce the ability to just make larger and larger trucks that are kind of grocery getter SUVs. But. So for me, it starts with language. How many of you call it an accident? And how many of you call it a crash? Okay, uh, it's a simple thing. An accident means something completely different to you. And I actually had this conversation with my wife when I first started using the language because she hated it. And then she began to understand why I was using the term crash instead of accident. Uh, it's a something in the term of that pedestrian walked out, uh, uh, just walked out across the intersection without even paying attention to the car. The assumption is the car owns the intersection. Right? Uh, so some of these are cultural, some of these are language pieces. Um, for those who don't want to see more cars on the road, we hit peak car in 2012, or 2017, excuse me. We're not coming back. Um, but in order to be able to, uh, to, to fix that, we need to be able to enable mode shift. And mode shift is pedestrian and it's bicyclist. But, you know, Pittsburgh's like a lot of major urban areas. It's a victim of not having a mass transit system that is robust enough to be able to serve its needs. Uh, Applying these same technologies to the trash truck, to the street sweeper, to the bus, right? All of these services that the city provides can ultimately create a, a safer environment. And then finally, you know, where we've seen it in places like Herald Square in, in New York City, let's just shut them down for cars. Let's just create dedicated right-of-ways for personal light vehicles, for pedestrians, for mobility devices, for mass transit vehicles. There is no reason why we have to have this many roads that are just for one mode of transportation. It doesn't make any sense at all. So there's a real estate issue. That's actually one of the things that Singapore focused on first, because what they had to do for every parked vehicle, they had to actually build more island out into the ocean so you could park your vehicles. Now, how ridiculous is that, right? Yeah, I, I, I agree. That is it is the focus on the on the car culture that is the biggest the biggest challenge so nitsa the national highway traffic safety administration um, you know which focuses on the car crashes you know a lot of that focus and research has been on the crash test dummies and the, you know again internal to the vehicle and uh, another example is that just you know there's been so much excitement now and activity around the you know electric vehicles and the applications of electric vehicles it was really you know just when uh, at the transportation research board annual meeting uh, uh, Jennifer Homedy head of the um, the um, NTSB which is kind of not under Department of Transportation, but directed from Congress, um, you know, she brought up the fact that, hey, these new electric vehicles are a lot heavier and are gonna be a lot more dangerous to pedestrians. And all of a sudden it was like a huge kind of just, oh yeah, you know, with the whole group because everyone was so caught up in the hype of, electric vehicles, electric vehicles, electric vehicles, and this is gonna, this is gonna be so great you know, from an environmental standpoint that all of a sudden you know, it was just you know, very striking to be in that room when she kind of popped that balloon and said, oh yeah, what about the pedestrians? So uh, I do think that it's, we need to really start looking at it from the cultural side. I was just gonna add as well, I think like from a, um government perspective like we we have seen obviously cities like Pittsburgh caring about 
people outside of the vehicle now are at least like engaging in these conversations and how do we um, work toward vision zero. But I, it, it's certainly not happening nearly fast enough, but I have been optimistic more recently seeing things like the smart grant applications, which do require in the um, implementation of those grants, like community engagement and those conversations about community safety, not just the technology, sort of for the technology's sake, but um, state DOTs are seeing a lot more roles being hired for like bike ped and micro mobility, and those are like teeny tiny departments or a single staff right now, but like if that continues to grow, I mean traditionally we know a lot of state DOTs have really just been focused on vehicles and highways and so I do think there is a cultural shift happening not fast enough in the US but I am optimistic that like we're seeing some of this change in recent years in the areas of sort of focus or priority for even state and federal levels. Um, I know food's starting to get put out, so people are probably getting anxious, but if there is one, would you, should we wrap up? Okay, well, we'll have lunch to answer more questions, but thanks so much to the panelists. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. it.